Okay, we're going to do a quick switch over here to Christopher Stapleton. He is the president of Real World Laboratories, an applied research firm for innovative media installations, including work for Disney, Universal, Nickelodeon, and others. Hi, thank you. Did this work? Does this work all right? All right, great. Hi, I'm talking about mixing realities for experiential learning. And one of the areas is that I've been exploring it from an artist's point of view, working from theme parks and so forth, to really look at experiential learning beyond the accumulation or retention of knowledge, looking at attitudes and also um, skills and, and other things, particularly things that are in related to innovation skills, like creative problem solving, which is really challenging to teach, especially with content on self-directed uh, learning. So in mixing realities, how does augmented reality really impact learning? One of the really key things here is that we're dealing with the real world and we're dealing with experience. And these are two things that we really kind of, we're still working from a, a, a residual uh, kind of process of the Victorian style learning where we're, we're retaining knowledge, taking tests, and even this test, teaching to the test process, we're still looking at filling out forms and answering questions as problem solving. Now, you, you're asked to tell, you know, answer the problem, you know, pencil in the, the bubble, but is that really problem solving, especially creative problem solving? So it's really an aspect, when you come to creative problem solving, you really need experience and experiential learning format to really look at that. And f since John Dewey uh, in the 19th century has really been pushing for this, it really hasn't been, uh, you know, embedded in a lot of standard testing uh, 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 schools. Um, and museums. Museums is where we're supposed to have experiential learning, but a lot of times it doesn't go far enough to really look at it, and museums tend to repeat the school's objectives of, of aiming for standards. So experiential learning, it's, it's a matter of making the complex intuitive. I'm uh, sorry, it's being cut, my, my slides are being cut off. And so looking at this more complex area, we have, looking at it, a creative problem solving, we have complexity from low to high on the y-axis and creative options along the bottom. And so when we look at a lot of learning, um, we have the very simple at the lower left-hand side, you know, a vending machine. You can probably figure out a vending machine. It doesn't have many options to go by and has pretty much, uh, you know, no, not too much complexity. Put in the coin, get the soda. And then you have a dissertation, um, which is a lot more creative, a lot more options, a lot more complex. Um, we have finger painting, which is kind of a lot of creative options, very simple. Um, and then you have disassembling and assembling a toaster blindfolded. Well, that's very complex, and, but there's probably just one way to do that. And so we, we kind of want to find a space in between. But in self-directed learning, they, the media has to have this dialogue with the learner to get there. Now, a teacher can do that very well and very intuitively. So one of the things is that we want to avoid the upper left, which is really frustrating. We don't want to over-frustrate them. Uh, yet, yet in a lot of areas, what people will see something that's, that's below their skill level and seem childish. Now, if you're a child, that's fine. But, you know, it's not that it's bad, but it, it's, it's oversimplified. Um, and then if you get to the vending machine area, it's very boring kind of uh, content. And then doing too much options, too much creative options becomes very ambiguous. Where am I going? What am I doing? And so we're trying to get this uh, space in between being having to be a professor or, you know, a child can do the finger painting. A robot could probably do these, these frustrating tasks and, and you have some unskilled labor to be able to kind of, you know, or a machine to do other things. And so, so a lot of the learning in museums tend to be at the lower left-hand corner. You push a button, get an answer. And, 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 and there's, there's some play involved, but the play isn't necessarily directly related and folding into the actual learning process. And when you come into a GUI, into the, uh, the uh, augmented reality, it tends to have the graphic standard and the methodology of keep it simple, stupid. But really, we're dealing more and more with complex things. We want to go in the opposite direction and with experiential learning and working with creative problem solving. So I want to kind of show you where we've been. And I'm going to run through a lot of like 20 years of my research uh, very quickly. I've been working with Broadway and feature films, went in 10 years doing mega theme parks, and then went into this 
then starting a laboratory on experiential media and mixed reality where we applied entertainment not as an end but as a means to really kind of find how to get this more complex experiential aspect much more intuitive into learning. And one of the key areas of mixed reality is what we're bringing to it is that we have the real and we have the virtual, but the things that people we really don't recognize is that it's the imagination that brings that together. All these things, all these worlds, is mediated through the imagination in theme parks. And there's two types of imagination. One is the expressive imagination of the entertainer, of the educator, but you really have to understand the, imagina the empathetic imagination of the learner or the audience. And this is a conversation that's constantly going on, whether it's automated, whether it's live, whether it's virtual, et cetera, which is a video game. And so one of the things I've been doing, I've been working with CGI since I graduated from NYU in 84, working with VR since 90s, and MR since the early 2000s. Uh, we've been applying it to different areas, from teachers to soldiers to surgeons to therapists to, to all sorts of different aspects in museums, and each application taught us something else about the media of mixed reality. But all of it, including theme parks, the magic is really behind the eyeballs. Um, you can, there's a lot of technology is still need to be worked on, but we really have to look at what that imaginary world is in relationship to the real and virtual world. Uh, world. And entertainment, interactive entertainment has been doing this for thousands of years. It's just now that it started to be computer generated. And the key is working with story to stimulate the imaginary world. That imaginary world gains physical uh, presence with toys inside the real world, and the games escalate that interaction through the game mechanics. And this is a virtual cycle that goes on with interactive entertainment. The odd thing about the entertainment industry is these are three different industries. They don't talk much to each other. And so one of the things we had to do with the research is really look at what entertainment is and how these intuitively work together and how they work together with our imagination and our cognition. Um, and then so we looked at the interplay connections, really bringing story playing game together by breaking it down, seeing how they interrelate um, and how they, they're interdependent of each other. Where the story kind of asks, why should I care? It taps into the emotions. Play answers, what do I do? It, 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 it engages them um, into activity and the game escalates it into, into working beyond that. And so what we've done is applied this to more of a learning process of being what you know and sense, what you plan and decide, and what you act and respond. This is what soldiers do, this is what commanders do, this is what surgeons do, this is what teachers do, and it's a cycle which is, you know, 15, you know, microseconds or, or minutes or days or months. And it's a process that goes around that is interrelated with this interplay of story playing game. And so one of the issues here is really looking at mixed reality as a full continuum of the real, the virtual, and what I call the imaginality. Um, since you have virtuality and reality, why not imaginality? And what that is is that it's going over across all, all these senses into our sensory perception and media, and all mediated within the imaginary, the imaginary, the imaginality, both external perception and internal perception, what we're, we're processing that from our memories, uh, from our expectations and desires. And what's real important here is that it's not just a focal perception of the device. You having, you having the focal perception, the peripheral, the tangential, which is you, what you don't see, but you know that's that there, that you're modeling in your head. And there's ways to get inside under the skin by looking at haptic audio and so forth. And each one of those senses are working at all those levels. And each sense has a different process and a different advantage. And each sense has a different form of memory working within your brain. And when you look at all these senses and all these realities, you also have this depth of the working memory, which is the conscience, but you also have the procedural memory, which is working actually in the subconscious. That's why you can drive in, in text. Um, not safely, but um, <laughs> that's what you can do. But also performers tend to work with a flow state, which is more of a hyperconsciousness. So this is a really complex thing that's going on. Uh, when you map it to the brain, and you're looking at all this very exciting uh, research happening on the brain research, you're looking at the sensory input and looking at how different parts of the brain are processing this from the perceptions, the emotions, the experience, the imagination, the expression, and, and the reflection all working together. So, but you know, some senses work in different ways, like olfactory is directly connected to the emotions where the others aren't. Uh, haptic is our only two-way sense. Audio is our only 360-degree sense. So that all has a different function in all these different areas that we need to look at. In the cognitive rehabilitation 
uh, uh, cognitive, um, augmented cognition research done by DARPA, <laughs> Case Danny saw that we can increase our working memory by three times working with all senses. So we're, that means that we're really working at one third of our capability, which is not really good. So we applied all this to an experiment with a lunar colony with NASA and a mock up of a full scale museum exhibit, and we wanted to apply all the latest social technology and theme park techniques and sandboxes and, and so forth to really kind of get, you know, what does this happen? And one of the things is we got a very exciting environment, but we didn't know how to uh, really kind of develop this. The good thing about mixed reality is that we can have throughput of content and we tell many stories and that can constantly develop. So we're working with this, this physical, this, this changing the idea of the interface, taking the physical, like working with a puddle, a fidget, like working with a junkyard, or digital, the video game, and bring it together and really look at it, the fidgetal interspace. But the interface was not good either, because when we had video games in this exhibit, they were stuck in face with that monitor and not having a social experience, and it was hard to take them out of the virtual presence into a physical activity when we were able to have both physical and virtual within this lunar colony. So we wanted it more like a board game, where it's a social interaction, so that it was more of like this interspace between technology and people and things that we didn't get sucked up into that virtual world. And into this digital interspace, we found that this was a solution. So we made a prototype. This is a, a curio cabinet that was owned by a, a steampunk um, a, a biologist back in time of Jules Verne, all fictional, and he had this vernal pool in the top drawer that had a, a whole simulation of these fictional uh, life forms that were in a water. Uh, and they were behaving. And we had uh, audiences come in and, uh, and interact with this, 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 this digital interspace. And they could work with physical objects and have influence on the virtual environments. They could interact with the biologists. They were able to kind of look at the, his journals. And we had all this combination of real, virtual, and imaginal stuff. And to see what we wanted to create, and this is the issue, is that the, the NASA exhibit showed us that the GUI got in the way. It was oversimplifying. We wanted a simulation that we wanted, with creative problem solving, people to deal with frustration and ambiguity. And so that was very difficult in the typical learning situation. And so what we had to do is read the audience in, in doing that and find a method to interact with that. And so this was very exciting as far as where we just let them go, no instructions, and they went through the scientific process naturally, by itself, by just the bringing in the curiosity, and they were able to deal with frustration and ambiguity much better. Because what we found in NASA is that when, when frustration and ambiguity came around alone, it was a negative experience. When they done with someone else, a social experience, it was a positive experience. If we fix the ambiguity and frustration, it would be a neutral uh, experience, and we wanted to keep it a positive experience. So we wanted to figure out how to make ambiguity, frustration, and all those things actually fun. That's the area that we can kind of do it with. So we want to get this thing between this frustration, childish, boring, and complex, and we just need to build and figure out how that we can build the media up so that we can have the simulation, the stimulation, capture the behavior, find meaning from that behavior, adapt the simulation, you know, and, and challenge the, the learner further, escalate or de-escalate what we learn, and really look at the, the, the assessment and repeat, and really look at that, that, that direct learning that leads to achievement. I mean, because inter education needs to be achieved, not consumed, where entertainment can be just consumed, but then that should be perpetual, that should be ongoing. And so what we need to do is get that, that learner with that empathetic imagination, that wanting to learn, they naturally want to learn, to the expressive imagination of the content producer and have this conversation between st striking their imagination, creativity, and emotion, but also reading how they're dealing with risk and trial and error and frustration and ambiguity by really kind of really having this conversation through all the sensing device. The same sensing device that stimulates the, the simulation needs to read the user in order to understand as it, as it comes through. And, and we're using story to help construct it to go through our instructional events of the interplay instructional strategy that we come up with in here. Um, and I can go a whole semester on that. Uh, but there's six uh, instructional events that deal with story, play, and game. Uh, which then come back into our, our learning theory. And, and the area that we're in now with all of our research is what is that conversation between the learner and the media? Because if we're having a self-directed experience in the museum that may not have a human being there, the, how does the media 
work with that. And one of the things here we have, we've been working on, on cognitive rehabilitation on a human experience modeler on how do you capture uh, behavior um, and how do you bring meaning to that in order to uh, get uh, insight. And one of the things here that we want to be able to look at imagination, creativity, and emotion with experiential learning theory to advance the theories because they're kind of stuck back in vocational um, uh, periods and, we're, and they don't really address imagination, creativity, and emotion, which is very important in creative problem solving in the future workforce. And so we want to be able to recognize, respond, and respect that learner in where they are, what they're doing, what their interests are, and how can we direct the media to do that. And so we, in recording position, orientation, facial, gesture, voice, uh, and action, and decisions, we can, this is where we're looking at to find our uh, way that we can adapt the content to get to the awe factor. I hope Ori respects that. Uh, amplifying wonder for everyone. And just remember, experiential learning, some of the smallest moments make the biggest memories. It's not simple, but it's intuitive to making memories for a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you.